Father, we love you. We thank you for another chance to study your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, you will be our ultimate teacher this morning. Help us to see through the scriptures what that you would have us to do in this season of political chaos, pandemic, civil unrest, economic uncertainty, and mental strain. All these things we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 23 in 2020. Psalm 23 in 2020. That's what we wanted to focus in on this Sunday morning. By continuing this series and landing now here at verse number five. Verse number five of Psalm 23, reading from the English Standard Version, as is our custom, reads as follows. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Here's what I want to tell you about this psalm as way by way of subject embrace uncertainty. Yeah, I said it. Embrace uncertainty. Acts chapter 12. King Herod is in the midst of a violent attack on the church in Jerusalem. This has already led to the death of the apostle James the brother of the Apostle John, and now even the arrest of the Apostle Peter. While Peter was in prison, the church began to pray earnestly. Praise God for praying church. The night before Peter was taken, was to be taken away to be killed, he was chained the two soldiers in a holding place that was guarded by a band of another soldiers. In the midst of all this, turmoil, the question must be asked, what was Peter doing? Again, it was supposed to be the night before his martyrdom, his murder, his killing. He is chained the soldiers, Roman soldiers, the top uh, uh, of the uh, military army and uh, guard of his day. And then the, the place where he is being held is being protected by another band of soldiers. And guess what Peter is doing, y'all? Sleep. <laughs> yeah, only true disciples of Jesus Christ could sleep in the midst of uncertainty. I want you, and I would love for myself, to respond like Peter when we are in the midst of difficult and uncertain situations. It's vital that we do so. As born-again, blood-washed, baptized believers in Jesus Christ, we must have steadfast confidence in God despite our surroundings and the depress depressing realities that make them up. <laughs> For no matter where we are in life, here's your joy, friend. Here it comes. God is there too. But let me say that again. No matter where you are in life, God is there too. Um, in fact, you are never alone. His prevailing presence will comfort and guide you. In fact, this is the point of the message. God's presence uh, supersedes that of your foes. His providence is sufficient. His provision, 
I should say, is sufficient. The Lord will provide. And that's what Psalm 23 and 5 affirm to us. It affirms two truths that, that shows that God's presence supersedes that of your foes. Here is the first truth in the first part of verse number 5. Mark it down. We got to celebrate. We must celebrate this truth. The Lord's presence is sufficient. And then the other truth is that the Lord's provision is sufficient. Watch it. Watch it unfold to us. This, this, this verse makes it, it makes it profoundly clear that God is with us even when it seems like the deck, the, the deck is stacked against us. God is with us when it seems like all is lost. God is with us when we are fell, when it feels as if our foes, our enemies, our adversaries are there to attack us. He is with us. What I love about this psalm it, is that it reveals the ups and downs of life and how consistent God is in the midst of the inconsistency of our, of our, the inconsistency of our circumstances. Let me say that again and let me get it clear. Let me say it clear. Let me be grammatically correct when I say it this time. God is consistent when life is inconsistent. Let's dive in, friend. Let's look at this, this, this first truth. We need to celebrate. It is the sufficiency of the Lord's presence. Please note that. I know it's I know it's bedrock simple to you, but please note it anyway. You're going to need that as you face the various vicissitudes of life. Look at this psalm again. Psalm 23 begins with this powerful thesis statement that is penned by the author David in poetic fashion. He lets us know that the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And then in verses two through four, he proves the aforementioned point. He, he traces a day in the life of a good shepherd with his sheep. David explains the why he, why he feels the way he does about his shepherd. Why is this shepherd so sufficient that he have no reason to want? His good shepherd makes him lie down in green pastures. He, he leads him beside still waters. He, he restores his soul. And even if he's walking in paths of righteousness, He's doing it for the shepherd's own namesake. And then the shepherd's name becomes the dominating motivation for his acts of grace. Watch this. Even in dark places, the shepherd is still good because his prevailing promises and his past resume makes the sheep fear no evil. The sheep is in darkness, but the sheep is not afraid. I'll say it again. The sheep is in darkness, but the sheep is not afraid because the sheep knows that the shepherd is there even when he's walking in the midst of darkness. But what now? David seemingly closes the curtain and puts up another backdrop, if you will. He, he, he puts up another spread behind him on his on his a uh, zoom a uh, meeting here there's another virtual background that he pre he presents to us it's again in poetic fashion it it still centers around his confident his confidence and his trust in God he is confidently trusting God he he now makes a shift though he he is shifting metaphors right in the middle of this psalm for us in verse number four at this latter end he his metaphor shifts from a good shepherd to a gracious host no longer is he picturing God as a shepherd caring for his sheep but he now in verse number five Pictures this same God that was a good shepherd as a gracious host. 
He is no longer outdoors, but indoors. He is no longer a sheep in God's flock, but he is now a guest in God's house. While it is a different picture, I must stress to you, Sinai, the progression is still palatable for us to understand. He still wants us to understand that the goodness and the gracious nature of our God positions us to be at a point where we have nothing to want. Mm, Listen to what he says again in this power-packed verse. He says, you still talking to God, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This opening phrase here zeroes in on this notion about the sufficiency of God's provision. Here is what he says to us. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. There's two movements here, I believe. Two movements here as it relates to uh, what we stated earlier, the Lord's presence, the sufficiency of the Lord's presence. Let me be clear what I meant here, uh, uh, the sufficiencies, the sufficiency of the Lord's presence. Le- watch the loving host at work. The loving host uh, has prepared a table. God is the loving host. He has intentionally set up his guests for future victory. David is a distinguished guest of God, and God has prepared for his guests a table. Can't you imagine it in your mind? Can't you see yourself in David's position, sitting at the table with all the luxuries that comes with it, the cushion of the scene, the the cushion of the seat, the the, the, the decoratives that are on the table, the the, 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 the entrees that is there for him to indulge in. He's prepared a table for him. The table is a significant term. When David shows kindness to the house of Jonathan, he tells them that they should always eat at his table. In Proverbs 9, 1 and 2, Solomon talks about how wisdom prepares her table. God has arranged it so that future blessings are readily available for those who uh, have sovereignly, uh, that he has sovereignly chosen to bless. This is a reminder that you and I do not have to compete for God's blessing. The table is already prepared. You don't have to do underhanded tactics or schemes. God will take care of you at his table. You don't have to worry about it when it seems like evil is winning and godliness is losing. No, God has prepared the table. You don't have to stress when your uh, resources run low and scheme when your uh, resources dry up because God is yet still preparing a table. You don't have to fret when it seems as if your friends and family has walked away from you. God is just preparing table. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for they like the grass and will wither away but trust in the Lord. Do good dwell in the land and be friend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Why do you make such a case here? It seems as if you're over exaggerating. You're, you're over emphasizing this. Preacher, we get the point. God has prepared a table. That's great. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, but here's the tension. He's prepared it before me in the presence of my enemies. See that, 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 that right there, that little, little attitude you just got right there is, is why you're struggling to be in, this, in the place where God needs you to be to bless you because you want God to bless you in the perfect climate. We, 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 we want 
We want a pandemic and we want normalcy. And, and God is saying, you, we, 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 we want to deal with the political chaos, but we want everything to be calm, cool, and collective. We, 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 we want everything, or we understand that God can set us up in the midst of difficult situations, but we really don't want the difficult situation. Hear the shark that comes from the pen of the psalmist. He is fully aware that he is unworthy of the graciousness of the host. He, he says, you prepared the table before me. The, the, he's the lowly guest. He, he does not feel as if it's subtle, but it's significant. He does not feel that he deserves to be at the table. And can I remind you and can I remind me this morning that we don't deserve to be at God's table. Can you hear the shock in the tone of the psalmist? You prepared a table before me? This bashful psalmist. It's taken to another place of curiosity. And he says, not only am I shocked that you would do this for me, I'm also shocked of who else you would invite to the party. Please note here, he says, in the presence of my enemies. Please note, the enemies are literal. We are in poetry, but the, enemy, the enemies are literal. Everyone has enemies, especially if you are a lover of God. In fact, you cannot love God and expect the world to love you back. James 4 and 4 reads, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You and I must learn that God is strategic when he is blessing us. He purposefully allows adverse people in our life to show up at times that are uncomfortable for us to remind us that he is yet still in control. God does not need an ideal situation to hit a home run. God does not need an ideal background to get us there. Here's the comfort that David must have as the invited guest amongst the gracious host is that the king will have his back. Uh, that, 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 that's the, the shifting, I believe, in the metaphor as well. Shepherd the king. He, he's, he's been both. He's been a shepherd and he's been a monarch. David understands what it means to invite someone to the table. He understands that inherently there's a social contract of cover charge there. That, that means if I invited you to the place, I, I am responsible for assuring your safety. What am I trying to say to us? What is Psalm 23 trying? I'm moving on. Say to us in 2020 if, that our God is still good in the midst of a pandemic. Our God is still good. With, un, with injustice all around us. God is still good when the, and the stock market may crash. A double dip recession is said to be headed our way. I trust that the shepherd didn't bring me this far to leave me now. Hmm. In fact, we got to move on now because the presence of the shepherd points us to the next truth that lies within the provision of the shepherd. Are you still with me? You, 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 didn't, you didn't prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. But here comes the refreshment of God. I love this. David paints the picture of a tense circumstance. And what looks like a devastating plan was actually a divine setup because he brought my enemies to the table for he could see the provision, for they could see the provision that God is about to give me. He, 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 he anoint, you, you anoint, David says, you anoint, you anoint my head, you anoint my head with 
Oh, all here. Uh, I have three core purposes, which are for smoothness, brightness, and a positive smell. This is what takes place here. Uh, the all here that's placed on David's head smooths out his appearance. It it brightens up his appearance, and it gives him a little smell good at the same time. It, I believe all three of these are working here in this metaphor. The host has made sure that his hospitality has ostended so much to this guest that this guest now is in a place where his disposition is well his scent, his scent is well his, his appearance is well all because the shepherd and because the king that has invited, uh, invited him the gracious host has anointed his head and, and is that not just like our God? But there's a deeper lesson here. Many of us would have missed the blessing of the anointed head because we have been spending too much attention on our enemies. You, you know we would act a show no fool there. What, what, what they doing here? Why, why are, are they here? Who invited them? If, if, if they're here, I'm leaving. If, uh, uh, you know how we would have act. You know how we get even. And, and, and now everybody's long in the church. But you walked out some Sundays because you saw somebody you didn't like. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that, that's our inherent problem as fallen people. That we forget that the person next to me is not my problem. Especially when I'm under the banner of God's safety. He'll keep me in the midst of whatever. I'm facing. That's what I'm trying to say to us as we look in a land that is inherently unjust. We look in a land that has every ism that you can think of. Racism, sexism, classism and so on and so on. But there is still good news coming from heaven that God is yet still good. God is yet still sustaining us in the midst of whatever we find around us. See, greatness brothers and sisters uh, is defined by our ability to embrace the uncertainties of life. In fact, I'll go even deeper here, and I'm press on. It's defined by our ability to serve even when the pressure is on. There's no one in any sphere of life who have experienced great success despite difficulties, who have made, who have, who have, have, have experienced that success without the ability of fortitude, steadfastness, patience, endurance, understanding that sometimes in life, Everything don't work out in my favor, but can you be like our master teacher, Jesus himself, that was headed to the cross of Calvary to die on the cross for your sins and my sins. And the other 12 of which he had trained are arguing about who's going to wash one another's feet. And Jesus, John tells us in the 17th chapter, while they are arguing, releases himself of his clothes and puts on an apron, scoops down and begin to wash his servants' feet. Oh, my brothers and sisters, maybe that's what we should be doing in the midst of everything we're facing. Serving more. Maybe that's the message of the pandemic, of the political chaos, of the protest, that our servitude ought to be up higher. Then there's not just refreshment, there's renewal. It's real simple here, y'all. His cup overflows. 
Here the cup represents the circumstances of life. It metaphorically represents one's ultimate destiny. Here again, we see the picture of God's extravagant generosity. If the Lord gave David what he deserved, David's cup would have been filled with wrath. If, if God would gave David what he deserved, his cup would have been filled with judgment. And don't you look at David that way and smug your nose at him. Uh, if God would have gave you what you deserve, if he would have gave me, what I deserve, wrath would be in our cup. Judgment would be in our cup. But thank God for the mercy of God. Thank God for the grace of God. Thank God for the love of God that despite our failures, our shortcomings, our cup runs over. It's running over. Can't you hear that? You, you hear that knocking sound? That, that's the knocking of old Peter in Acts chapter 12. We, we, when, we, when we introduced this sermon, we, we saw him chain the soldiers asleep. But Peter soon realized that God can make a way out of no way. Uh, angels came, woke him up in his sleep. David, uh, Peter himself thought he was dreaming. God made a way. He shows up to the church after being let go and knocks at the door. Rhoda opens the door. The young servant girl, she says, Peter's at the door. But guess what, y'all? She didn't even let Peter in because she didn't believe it. The church that was praying didn't believe it. But guess what Peter did? He just kept on knocking at the door. And I'm talking to somebody here that your friends don't believe it. Your, even the church may not believe your breakthrough, but just keep on knocking at the door and, and show that God will He'll make a way out of no way. Is there anybody here that can testify that this morning? Is there anybody in your home, in your place of leisure that can testify he will make a way out of no way? Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Let's pray. Father, we are far from what we need to be. Thank you for sparing grace and loving mercy. Help us, Lord, to hear the words of this very simple scripture. <clears throat> Dear God, we pray that you would help us to remember that you pray a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies, to anoint our head with all. And our cup overflows. This is for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.